listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 25th, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, atopic dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Luz Fanasio. She's a professor of clinical medicine in the Division of Allergy at SUNY at Stony Brook at NYU Winthrop Hospital. Thank you. I mean, this is a very exciting topic now that we have uh, at least two new medications and more coming up. And so, uh, if you will notice, if you compare my COLA presentation now and as of last year, there's a lot of difference in it in terms of what the emphasis is. So, my disclosures are we have a research and educational grant paid to the hospital. I'm a speaker for general and a consultant with Church and White and Regeneron. What I, I know this is for um, fellows, and so the objectives is to identify common mimics of atopic dermatitis, discuss uh, workup, and as I said, discuss uh, treatments, uh, both old and new. Uh, going through the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, we have these immunologic abnormalities, barrier dysfunction, and non-immunologic uh, mechanisms, which we thought initially were uh, three distinct um, uh, mechanisms, but now we know that the immunologic actually causes barrier dysfunction and the non-immunologic causes barrier and immunologic abnormalities as well. And so it's interesting to see how these mechanisms actually coexist and feed on each other. So for the immunologic abnormalities, we know that there are that the that, uh, that atopic dermatitis is a Th2, Th22 deviated immune reaction, and the Th2 cytokines such as IL-4 and IL-13, and the Th22, which is the IL-22, uh, can stimulate the B cells to produce IgE, and as well, you have the humoral immune responses, which increases IgE to allergens. The barrier dysfunction uh, is caused by cytokines such as IL-22, which are strong suppressors of a barrier protein such as filaguin and loricrine. So you can see how they interact with each other. And of course, you have non-immunologic mechanisms. You have the itch scratch cycle. You have anxiety. You have your irritants your wool perspiration detergent, you have a sensitivity to environmental factors such as extremes of temperature and humidity, and the patient being prone to infection and colonization, especially to staph. So looking at this very quickly, you see that in patients with atopic dermatitis, uh, a disturbed epidermal barrier actually leads to an increased permeation of antigens. Uh, they then will encounter your Langerhans cells and your dendritic cells, uh, which then uh, will activate your Th2 cells and um, produce IL-4 and IL-13. These dendritic cells will then go to the lymph node uh, where they will activate your effector T cells and induce the IgE class switching. So looking at the cytokines such as IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, and IL-31, uh, CCL-17, CCL-18, um, produced by Th2 cells and dendritic cells, uh, there is an infiltration of the skin uh, by more dendritic cells, mast cells, and eosinophils. The Th2 and Th22 T cells predominate in the uh, atopic dermatitis, but as we go on into the chronic, the Th1 and the Th17 uh, T cells start to contribute, also contribute to their pathogenesis. So look at the Th2 cells, which will secrete IL-4 and IL-13, uh, and the IL-31, which we are looking at new monoclonal therapy that because IL-1 seems to be predominant in, in the induction of itch. Um, and then you have the TH2 um, cytokine IL-22, which 
inhibits the terminal differentiation and contributes to the barrier defect in patients with atopic dermatitis. I want you to realize, though, that the normal-looking skin, which we were calling non-lesional skin, actually is not normal. There is a briar defect. There is an increased epidermal proliferation and thickness in this area. There's an ongoing subclinical inflammation, increased sensitivity to allergens, increased chance of infections, and it increased CD3 cutaneous T cells. So aside from being immunologically active in the skin, though, we would like you to think of atopic dermatitis as really a systemic disease. And some patients, oh, a lot of our patients actually have uh, allergic rhinitis and asthma uh, together with atopic dermatitis. One of the defects that we see in atopic dermatitis is filaggrin mutation. So what is filaggrin? Filaggrin binds to and is responsible for this keratin aggregation. So what happens is that uh, it induces the cytoskeleton to flap into each other and collapse. And when you have this collapsing, almost like brick and mortar thing, you have this uh, protection. They will cross-link, and you have this cornified cell envelope, which is a protection and is critical for effective skin barrier. So you will look at the skin without this skin barrier, without this protective corneocytes that are heavily cross-linked, you will lose your protective barrier. So that's what happens in um, uh, filaggrin mutation. So how do you manage atopic dermatitis? The, the first question really is to make sure that you have your diagnosis. So you need to make and confirm your diagnosis that this kid does have atopic dermatitis. And um, Larry Eichenfeld had actually, uh, uh, we so sort of set this up, and by the way, just FYI, the college is coming up with atopic dermatitis yardstick, which would have most of what I'm talking about. Uh, so there are essential criteria. This must be present to make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. It has to be itchy. It has to have an eczematous morphology, acute, subacute, or chronic, uh, age-specific patterns in infants and children, involvement of neck, uh, face, neck, and extensors, or flexural areas in adults, uh, usually sparing the groin and the axilla, and it has to be chronic or relapsing. So if you see here, the essential criteria does not need the A2P or IgE sensitization, but that is a supporting criteria for the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. And they are early age of onset, the presence of A to P, which is either personal and or family history, an elevated total IgE or an elevated specific IgE, like the dust mite sensitization that you have, and the dryness of the skin. And then non-specific associated criteria, which will support your diagnosis, is like a typical vascular responses, keratosis pilaris, pityriasis alba, hyperlinear palms. You can have the periorbital changes, other regional findings in the nipple, especially atopic dermatitis tend to have nipple dermatitis in, in women, uh, adult women very follicular accentuation and the, the chronic like kenified pterygo nodularis and lichen simplex chronicus. So let's look at what you need to rule out. What are common immunodeficiencies with eczema? We have seen Wiscott Aldrich, Hyper IgE, Netherton's, CGD, and HIV infection. So let me present to you this six-year-old girl. She does look very atopic. You will see pyritic eczematous uh, dermatitis in the face, around her mouth, the arms, the back. It's really all over. And she had diarrhea and failure to thrive up to, up to one year of age. She has peanut allergy, and both parents have atopic dermatitis. Very high in our list is atopic dermatitis. However, uh, being so severe and looking at her hair, we need to consider Netherton syndrome plus the fact that she did have immunodeficiency symptoms. So this is rare, but it is something we need to look at. The patients can present with erythroderma or the redness that she had. It ha they have the bamboo hair. You will see here the bamboo looking 
uh, hair and you can either pull out the hair from the scalp but you can also pull out an eyelash and eyelash can probably uh, show this bamboo uh, configuration uh, uh, more readily. You have ichthyosis linearis circumflexa and uh, which is this, you will see how uh, they are migratory, polycyclic redness, erythema, you have scaling and you have double margins. Uh, they can have failure to thrive, like our patient. Uh, they have transient neutrophil defects, impaired cellular and immune responses, and elevated complements. Now this is an elderly patient, 61 year old, five year duration of pruritic eczema. She did not have any family history of ADP and she has since discontinued her medication for hypertension. And she had tried numerous topical corticosteroids which did not help. So for this patient, no atopic history in the past, elderly, you want to consider cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. The, the stage that probably will look more like atopic dermatitis is the patch stage where you can see this going on for a long time. They're thin, they're wrinkled, they're, but they're itchy uh, and they're common in the pre-mycotic stage and they can precede mycosis fungoides by years. So you find this in the trunk and buttocks. But you can also see some plaque stage, as you can see here, which can still look like atopic dermatitis. And finally, you have the tumor stage, which you can probably, as an allergist, distinguish and just uh, send off to the dermatologist for a skin biopsy. So if you have had your differential diagnosis and you know your, that it is atopic dermatitis, you want to determine this the, the disease severity of your atopic dermatitis. So literature review of clinical research in atopic dermatitis are actually 62 distinct severe scoring measures, 28 quality of life tools for atopic dermatitis, and three are validated. And this is the score, uh, the SCORAD, the easy score, and the POEM. Uh, when uh, uh, Drugs are being evaluated for atopic dermatitis. The FDA usually requires the score rather than the EC score, and then, of course, a quality of life. So looking at severity, when do you consider a patient with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis? Well, when the extent of disease is more than 10% of the body surface area. But regardless of the body surface area, if the areas involved are very visible, like this patient of mine, where it's important for function, such as the face, the neck, the hands, the soles, or their lesions are very severe. They get a lot of secondary infections, excoriations, and lichenification. That adds up to the severity of your atopic dermatitis. And finally, do not uh, forget the symptom burden and quality of life, which is itching is the main and sleep quality is the other and then emotional and mental health disturbances and interference with the daily activity of the patient. So how do you determine extent of disease? The score right, is the rule of nines here, and this is as they would use in burn, in evaluating burn patients. The easy, however, is probably not so easy. It divides the body into four bands, and you have to have percentages in each band and how each one is uh, evaluated and how each one is rated. A recent systematic review revealed that the most consistent method across age and race is to equate the adult palm without the fingers as about half a percent of the total body surface. So when you're in your 9% here, you still need to know whether it's really 9% and it's, if it's only half of it, it's probably just 4.5% which is about nine of the of your palms, adult palm without uh, your fingers in terms of size. In terms of the, uh, determining the severity, as, is, as we said, it, you look at the redness, you look at the edema and the papules and in duration, you look at the scratching or excoriation, and you look at the plicanification, and then you have from zero to severe. The quality of life is sleep and pruritus. So I wanted to show this to you only to uh, emphasize to you that it's totally impractical uh, to use in routine clinical practice. So that's the SCORAD, 
where mild is less than 25, moderate is 25 to 50, and severe is over 50. And the easy score is mild is 1.1 to 7, moderate 7.1 to 21, and severe is 21 to 50. Uh, it very severe is 50 to 72. So um, an easier, a less tedious evaluation of severity of atopic dermatitis is probably what we call IGA, or Investigator's Global Assessment Score. It just divides it into clear, almost clear, mild, moderate, and severe disease. Uh, this is not a validated tool. It's static. It's just when you see the patient at the point of contact, and it only evaluates the signs and not the symptoms. It doesn't consider pruritus uh, in this, uh, and it does not include the BSA. Uh, so, however, it is simple, and the FDA has accepted that in the studies uh, for the evaluation of severity. So because the IGA does not include pruritus in our office, what we do is we do an IGA score, we do a pruritus score, and we do, which will give you the quality of life. And we do the uh, uh, body surface area. And it, all you need to say is it's less than 10% or more than 10%. The Parita score uh, is uh, 0 to 10. 10 is the worst. 0, of course, is no itch. 8 wakes you up at night. And 6 bothers you, uh, distracts you from your daily activities. Again, it is patient-reported, and it only assesses pruritus. Unfortunately, there are no validated biomarkers to diagnose or even monitor treatment in atopic dermatitis. There, as I said, uh, uh, if you have an elevated serum IgE, it the diagnosis, but it's not indicative. There are other biomarkers being studied, such as the TARC, the CTAC, E-selectin, eosinophil cationic protein, uh, LDH, and uh, macrophage-derived chemoattractant. When evaluating a patient who comes to your office, you want to look at triggers as allergies. We are stronger than the, on this than our uh, dermatology uh, colleagues. Uh, we look at bacterial superinfection. So here you see a patient with honey-crusted uh, impetigenous lesions. You may want to consider uh, skin and nasal cultures and empiric antibiotics. If you have a MRSA, unfortunately, uh, if you culture a MRSA, you need to look at everybody in the household. You may need to culture them. You may need to culture the dog, according to uh, 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 Donald Leon. Uh, eczema herpeticum. Your patients are sicker when they have eczema herpeticum. They have fever. They have lymph adenopathy. You see the skin is uh, has a lot of vesicles and, er and uh, erosions. How do you diagnose it? A chunk prep, a culture, and give them a cyclovir. Dermatophytic infection or fungal infection, you will see a scaly rash or even nail involvement. You want to do a KOH prep or a fungal culture. This is uh, Malassezia symphondialis, which is common in the seborrheic area. Uh, patients with atopic dermatitis and these lesions have been shown to have IgE antibodies against M. symphondialis and when treated had an improvement of their atopic dermatitis. So bacterial Viral and fungal infections are triggers of atopic dermatitis. So you have your diagnosis, you look at triggers, and you're ready to treat your patient. And the principles of therapy are general supportive care, get your disease under control, and keep it under control. So with general supportive care, hydration is very important. As I said, they have barrier defects. They cannot keep that moisture in. Uh, emollients, pads, and wet wraps, which we will talk about. And you want to avoid your triggers, such as your irritants and specific allergens. Get to your disease under control. You have uh, anti-inflammatory medications and the strength of your usually topical corticosteroids or topical carcinoma inhibitors based on disease severity. And keeping it under control by giving steroid sparing agents, such as your uh, immunomodulators, which now includes crisaborol, 
uh, immuno devices which uh, didn't seem to uh, help very much beyond moisturizing our patients and we've had that for a long time and proactive treatment. So skin barrier and skin hydration, improvement of the skin barrier function has been seen in patients who use emollients regularly. It reduces irritation and it adds, actually strengthens the skin by delaying intercellular filaggrin uncoiling. So it makes uh, um, the filaggrin uh, stronger. The regular use of topical corticosteroid can actually decrease this function. It actually, on long-term use, inhibit epidermal fatty acid synthesis and disrupts barrier function, which is telling you that probably regular use of appropriate emollients is uh, more or as important than uh, topical corticosteroids. And so even if your patient topical corticosteroids, you want to make sure that they're still using emollients because, um, uh, because they do uh, something with the filaggrin and coiling. Baths uh, make it fun. That's the point of this slide. Uh, you, I tell the patients to two types of bathing. One is soaking for 20 minutes, may or may not add oatmeal or baking soda. It does, does not seem to make a difference. And quickly wash, or you have a, ten, a quick 10-minute bath, drip dry, apply your occlusive emollient immediately on wet skin. Do not towel dry intensively before applying your moisturizer because you lose that uh, hydration that the bathing had uh, provided. You can use any soaps. Mild soaps, we would give them Benederm, Dove Basis, Aveeno, Purpose, Cetaphil. Uh, some issues on antibacterial soap, such as chlorhexidine and triclosan, uh, maybe for short periods of time during the period of uh, acute infections or impetigal. Uh, for detergents of their uh, garments, use liquid rather than powder because powder might stay on the clothing and be an irritant. And always add a second rinse cycle. So let's talk about treatment, limitations of topical corticosteroids. There is a total steroid burden in these patients, which we need to be aware of. And there are side effects that we need to monitor. So the local side effects that you want to look at, you have this 3A, you see how the skin is thinned, and atrophy. Then you have uh, here your atrophic skin, and you have your telangiectasia. You will see here very prominent um, uh, blood vessels. And you have this pigmentation, which most of the time would be persistent. You can have rosacea and allergic contact hepatitis as well. Adrenal suppression, especially in infants and small children, needs to be monitored. And of course, there are other side, systemic side effects of very high doses of topical corticosteroids, metabolic, cataract, glaucoma, cardiovascular. And it's important to address the patient's fear of steroid side effects to improve adherence. We can't just ignore that. Second type of second group of medications that we know work for atopic dermatitis is your topical carcinoma inhibitors. Uh, it's especially useful for chronic use, long-term use in areas prone to atrophy, like the face, the eyelid, perioral area, genitalia, the, the flexural areas, especially axilla and inguinal area. So just for comparison, your 0.1% tacrolimus is uh, about the strength of an intermediate topical corticosteroid, which is higher than 1% pimecrolimus. Proactive treatment has been shown to be safe and effective for up to one year in reducing flares by the use of to uh, topical carcinoma inhibitors about two times a week. Limitation is the skin burning and pruritus. So uh, when you prescribe it to the patient, you tell them that this can occur, but it usually goes away in about five days. The theoretical cutaneous viral infection risk, such as herpes simplex and molluscum contagiosum, remains to be um, theoretical. The carcinogenesis is 
definitely theoretical, but there is still that black box warning. However, it's um, important to tell the patient with a case control study of over 300,000 atopic hepatitis patients treated with three uh, with topical carcinoma inhibitor actually did not find an increased risk of lymphoma. The severity of atopic dermatitis, the more severe AD patients, even without topical carcinoma inhibitor, actually had an increased risk of lymphoma. So then there's this peer study of uh, 7,457 children with 26,700 person years treated with pimecrolimus reported five malignancies with incidence rates comparable to the population. So again, no higher than the general population. We have topical antibiotics such as meperazine for localized impetigenized lesions. Systemic antibiotics will be more practical if it's generalized and, as I said, treat the nasal carriage. Interestingly, just treating with anti-inflammatory uh, medications uh, such as topical corticosteroids, TCI, have improved atopic dermatitis and uh, reduced the staph aureus colonization even without treating with antibiotics. Nucleid on the block is Crisaborol or Eucrisa. It's a novel PDG, PDE4 inhibitor and um, efficacy uh, is shown to be as early as day eight of treatment. It is for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. Reduction of atopic signs and symptoms were seen and a sustained improvement in pruritus uh, because PDG, PDE4 directly regulates pruritus to the reduction of cutaneous neuron and dorsal root ganglion activity. It has a very favorable safety profile. It is very expensive and uh, if not covered by insurance. So um, when, you, when you have a patient who is all uh, uh, with generalized dermatitis, also itchy in an acute crisis, you want an acute crisis intervention. And what it consists of is a 10 to 20 minute bleach bath once daily, then you apply twice daily your topical corticosteroids. So you put your topical corticosteroids at least a mid-potency on the wet skin, and then you apply an emollient on top of your topical corticosteroid, uh, and, uh, and, and then you put on your wet wraps. I'll show you how to do that later. So there is this fingertip method, which is the amount of ointment in an adult's fingertip is applied to the size of about two palms that uh, Larry Eichenfeld had suggested, just to give you an idea on the amount to uh, apply. Wet wraps include one pair in children, one pair of onesies, soak in warm water, wring out, one pair of one, put that on the patient, and another pair of onesies that's dry. Just make sure that the room is warm enough. Have the child sleep on that uh, the next day. It's usually, I have done this. Uh, I, I know National Jewish does this as an inpatient. I have done this. Maybe a patient at the most will say I can do it for three days. And they do make a big difference if they're able to tolerate it. The, what, what's the data on the bleach baths? Of, uh, this is probably the only patient on bleach baths, but 31 atopic dermatitis patients were given um, cephalexin for, for 14 days to eradicate the staph aureus. Then they were given intranasal muperazine and bleach bath or petrolatum in the nose and plain baths. Uh, for twice weekly for three months, and the easy score did reduce after a month uh, and three months compared to placebo. Uh, the thing though is the easy score only improved in body parts that were submerged in the bathing. Uh, so the head and neck, which cannot be submerged, obviously continued to have the atopic dermatitis, and we're really not clear whether the effect of the bleach bath can be explained by staph aureus reduction. A few studies are showing that the bleach actually may have some anti-inflammatory effects as well, and that's why it worked. Recurrence is seen as soon as you stop the bleach bath, too. So that's why I said it's just part of a crisis intervention. Um, wet wraps, the evidence of the wet wrap is as a short-term 
it is effective. You can use either topical corticosteroids or topical carcinoma inhibitors. Uh, the topical steroid is obviously more efficacious short term than emollients alone. Um, the wet wrap uh, uses uh, using topical corticosteroids up to 14 days is safe, but I don't think uh, most kids will tolerate 14 days of, of wet wraps. Uh, there, there was seen temporary systemic bioactivity. Uh, it, you are able to lower absolute amount of topical corticosteroids to once a day at some point. I do the wet wrap uh, probably um, twice, uh, daily for three days, three to five days, and then uh, as needed. It has its advantage of uh, decreasing the H threat cycle and decreasing the staff aureus. So then you did all of this, and uh, all the pieces of the puzzle are in place. You know you have the right diagnosis. You've ruled out hypersensitivity. You've controlled your secondary infection. Food and air allergens were investigated. You uh, spoken to the patient. You educated them. You have your psychosocial issues that were addressed, and your patient is still miserable. What are your options? Well, let's see. What do you define as treatment failure? There's really no de uh, standard definition of saying that the failure, that your treatment has failed. But there are different types of failure uh, that you will define. One is they just didn't improve clinically. Second is they did improve, but you failed to achieve a stable long-term disease control. They flare every now and then, or very frequently. Uh, they fail to relieve the impairment of quality of life. It's in the face. I mean, I can't go to work. My hands and my feet are severely affected. Or you start to see the unacceptable adverse effect uh, uh, leading to treatment discontinuation, this TRIA that we were talking about and um, the uh, telangiectasias. So which patient should be stepped up to systemic therapy? Those with extensive disease, as we said, more than 10% body yeah, those with severe lesions, you see excoriation like an infection and infection. Those with intense symptom burden, such as severe itching and poor quality of life, can't sleep, emotional, mental disturbance, and interferes with daily activity. So um, these are the patients with inadequate response to medium high potency topical corticosteroids, suboptimal clinical improvement, or failure to achieve long-term control or unacceptable side effects. Oral steroids is what most of our colleagues in uh, primary care and even dermatologists and allergies do use it as a, as a rescue. It is, it is effective, but it is almost always associated with dramatic rebound, so we, we really rarely use it. It is only reserved for crisis management. Uh, you need a strategy for long-term. You need to taper that dose, and you need to intensify skin care. It, it is not a replacement for that. You have other traditional systemic uh, management. You have the cyclosporin, which is given 3 to 6 milligram per kilogram per day, uh, with significant improvement in two to four weeks of treatment, and uh, anywhere from 53 to 95 percent improvement. It is superior to prednisolone, IVIG, or UVA therapy, but you have a lot of safety monitoring that you need to do. Renal impairment, hypertension, nausea, headache, you really cannot give it over two years without risking a permanent renal damage. Azathioprine does not have as good an improvement, about 39% improvement over methotrexate to 12 uh, weeks. Again, GI uh, systemic uh, side effects are high. Methotrexate, 42% improvement after four, 12 weeks, so it is a long period, nausea, elevated liver enzymes, and um, pancytopenia, hepatic and pulmonary uh, toxicity. Mycophenolate, inconsistent effect, uh, clinical data, but and also significant side effects. Phototherapy, a lot of our uh, dermatologists do this. You have the narrowband UBP. It, is, it has been shown to be uh, effective for uh, cr chronic, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Again, you have your risk of your uh, 
sunburn, erythema, redness, tenderness, or of course the skin carcinogenesis uh, risk is there with phototherapy. Looking at the new drug that is out there, the new drug that is out there is an anti-IL-4 drug, uh, and uh, that is your dupilumab. It's a monoclonal antibody against IL-4 and uh, uh, IL-4 receptor alpha subunit actually, which blocks IL-4, that uh, receptor, type 1 receptor is IL-4, or the type 2 receptor, which is an IL-4, IL-13. IL-13 has that uh, uh, IL-4 RA in it too. Uh, it's for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis who is not controlled by topical uh, corticosteroids or tacrolimus. Uh, there are two pivotal trials. There's a three, actually, four to eight week monotherapy. It means not even topical corticosteroid. And 52 week of uh, therapy where they are allowed topical corticosteroid. In both cases, it resulted in a rapid and dose dependent improvement. The Parida score decreased significantly by 55% in the dupilumab group compared to 15%. Uh, so, how do we step up from mild to moderate? Symptomatic despite appropriate use of topical corticosteroids, adherent to basic skin recommendations, and avoidance of allergen and irritants, you can either increase your topical corticosteroid dose and potency, make it BID, make it the moderate to high potency. You can add a topical carcinoma inhibitor, or you can add a crisoborol, which is a Ucrisa approved for mild to moderate. You are reassessed every four to six weeks. If you have inadequate response, define a suboptimal improvement, flares, ongoing impairment, or side effects. You can step up from moderate to severe. You can use the biologic therapy. You can send them for phototherapy. Or you can use systemic even a suppressant cyclosporine methotrexate as a type of. Note that this is not an FDA approved drug for atopic dermatitis. Not one of them is approved by the FDA. We uh, just, just a few slides on prevention and other things that are out there for uh, atopic dermatitis. So we're looking at uh, this interesting randomized controlled trial of 124 neonates with high risk for atopic dermatitis, meaning they have a family history of atopic dermatitis, mom, dad has it, or they have or asthma or allergic rhinitis, uh, and they just slathered these babies with full body emollient at least once a day, starting at three weeks of birth, or those who did not. And there was an interestingly protective effect in the cumulative incidence of atopic dermatitis. There's a risk reduction of 50%. Uh, and no emollient-related adverse effects really were seen and no difference in adverse effect between the two groups. So, I mean, this, I think, is a rare. Uh, if you look at the, the improvement, uh, the difference here between those who had intervention and those that had a control, the emollient therapy from birth really represents a very feasible, safe, and effective approach for prevention. Obviously, we need larger trials, uh, but it is very simple, and it is a low-cost intervention that might decrease the global burden of allergic disease. So something to think about doesn't cost them much. Vitamin D still, 48% of patients here at 18 with asthma, atopic dermatitis with allergy have a low vitamin D level. And vitamin D may play a, play a role in the regulation of antimicrobial peptides. It does increase the corticosteroid action. It does uh, improve skin barrier. It increases microbial peptide production. So theoretically, there is some report of it. Uh, the potential role is so in atopic dermatitis. If you look at the serum vitamin daily devil, this is the uh, score values. Those who have a more severe uh, atopic dermatitis has a lower uh, vitamin D levels than those who have high uh, have a have a lower uh, scores. Then there's also the seasonal variation that you will see that of, of vitamin D that you will see in December, January, February, where your vitamin D levels are usually lower. So. 
Camargo et al. actually looked at the effect of vitamin D supplementation on winter-related atopic dermatitis. This is interesting. It's double-blind, placebo-controlled. 107 Mongolian children uh, enrolled in winter because winter is the lower, uh, they, they have lower vitamin D. They did not do any vitamin D level baseline. Uh, they did easy scores and they, they just gave these patients uh, 1,000 international units a day of oral colecalciferol. And the results are those with the vitamin D supplementation produce a clinically and statistically significant improvement in easy score and change in investigator global assessment and there were no adverse side effects. Uh, their conclusion was vitamin D supplementation improved with the related atopic dermatitis on Mongolian children. Uh, there's another way, uh, there's another preventative uh, treatment that you can do, which is what we call proactive treatment with either topical corticosteroids or topical carcinoma inhibitors, and you will see here there are patients where they were given topical corticosteroids in areas that tends to flare for two consecutive evenings weekly. So they made them put topical corticosteroids, for example, in the flexural areas Saturday and Sunday, uh, and all the rest of the time it will be emollients. And uh, they saw that those were methylprednisolone was applied. They had 3.5 times less likely to flare. So that's proactive treatment. Clinically, good-looking, controlled-looking skin, just make them put your uh, uh, topical corticosteroids on the weekend. Uh, and uh, uh, this has also been shown with the Crolimus, as I said, where uh, uh, the flare-free days with the Crolimus is more, and the number of relapse per day for the Crolimus is less. Probiotics is uh, unfortunately have no conclusion. The Cochrane database system says that they are not effective in treatment of eczema in children. Um, it, uh, they may have some mod modest role in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So there's really no conclusion with probiotics at this time. Allergy shots have been given. Uh, there has there is data for uh, improvement of atopic dermatitis in aeroallergen sensitized patients, especially to dust mite. And you will see a dose response effect of dust mite immunotherapy uh, in patients with mild to moderate, but it probably doesn't work as well in those who already have severe atopic dermatitis. So these are the treatment strategies that we have for atopic dermatitis. In summary, we hydrate, we decrease the itch, we evaluate for triggers, we go up to topical carcinoma inhibitors or uh, topical corticosteroids, we increase their dose, we add glisoborol, we do wet wraps and tar preparations, and for those who still fail, we go into biologics, oral steroids as rescue, cyclosporine, ultraviolet light therapy, and hospitalization. So we have the traditional systemic management. We have the new kids on the block for atopic derm, and we have emerging therapies, IL-31 for pruritus, IL-13, and JAK inhibitors. I think JAK inhibitors are actually now on the phase three trials, and IL-31 as well. So, we would like to keep our kids from looking like this to get our kids to looking like this. So thank you, and let's open to questions. Okay. Thanks, Liz. That was a great yeah. presentation. Um, <clears throat> anybody have any questions? Because I have a couple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, one, um, we, you talked about vitamin D, which I think is important. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, um, um, that we talk about in the clinic, it, kids who have, um, look like they have bad eczema, looking at um, zinc deficiency, not only just because it may mimic, um, uh, may mimic eczema, <clears throat> but um, zinc is important in just skin healing. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, do you think it's important just to check zinc levels as well? Because if they're, if they're um, zinc deficient and do have, um, um, you know, eczema, that theoretically that may help as well. Like right. yeah. 
yeah. yeah. Zinc deficiency is a differential diagnosis for atopic dermatitis, but there are some classic signs of zinc deficiency, you know, in the face, around the nose type, and so you, uh, you get, you, it's certainly worth looking at this, especially in patients with facial facial dermatitis, and you will need to treat that, otherwise you keep on treating with topical calcineurin inhibitors or, or, uh, or uh, topical corticosteroids, especially in the face. Uh, you have to make sure that it's not uh, associated with a zinc deficiency or vitamin deficiency as well. Now, vitamin D deficiency was, is interesting because of the previous data that I showed you, because uh, there's this thinking that actually vitamin D deficiency uh, can aggravate atopic dermatitis, whereas the zinc deficiency, uh, I think at this point, is more of a differential diagnosis for atopic dermatitis. Either way, there is a, a good reason to get both levels uh, if we suspect that. Uh, but again, going to uh, Camarga's uh, study, they did not even do baseline vitamin D levels. We don't know whether these kids were deficient or not deficient. They were just given vitamin D. And um, there was improvement and there was no adverse side effects from the supplementation of vitamin D. So I know of at least a few dermatologists in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis who just put their patients on vitamin D. Well, the, part of the reason I also bring this up is that I run um, um, an EOE clinic um, and work with one of the GI doctors here, and we do um, uh, uh, vitamin D level and zinc level on all these EOE patients as mm -hmm. part of nutrition mm -hmm. screen. Um, and the interesting thing is that probably half of these kids have vitamin D and zinc deficiency. And these are kids that don't Together, have Together, individually. Mm -hmm. uh, some have both, some have one or the other, but we see a lot of vitamin D, and we, we actually see quite a bit of zinc deficiency who don't have dermatitis or anything else. So. Zinc is right. in lots of processes in the body, um, and it's involved in wound healing as well. Um, so I'm just curious. Uh, I was just curious about that, and maybe something to be worthwhile looking at. Um, it must, be, yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's interesting. I might do that here. I, I think maybe it's a good thing to look into, and probably see whether supplementation is going to help or not. Um, the to help the dermatitis. Had, yeah. The second question I had was. The um, the new therapy, the Crisabarol. Um, mm -hmm. The um, when you, uh, I guess, uh, I'm just thinking about the parents, and you're talking, um, you know, about all this stuff. But the uh, when you, you know, we usually tell people to put the steroids on first, then put the emollients on. But when you have, when you're also using the Crisabarol, and then you mentioned one of your slides, tar preparations. I mean, what's the sequence of that, or do you put some of these on, you know? like, you know, um, morning and night and some on during the afternoon yeah, or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this, this, yeah, yeah. This one on top of the other is very interesting, but the thinking is you put the active medication first and then you put on your emollient over it because then the active medication hopefully will penetrate more. So in terms of sequence, that's that's the thinking. So if it is the same with crisoborol, where you put your uh, crisoborol first and then your emollient on top of it. On the other hand, one, and, and that would be for the crisis intervention. What I do, and this is a personal thing, is that when they are, remember, they're, it's it's an ointment. They're oint if I give them ointment base, you already the base of your topical corticosteroid is already uh, a barrier in, in itself. So when they I've gotten them down to like mild to moderate is, I will skip the emollient on top of it. I would I would just say one. In the morning is an emollient, and in the evening on wet skin is your topical corticosteroid. So the crisparol, do you apply that together with um, a topical steroid? And if you do, which one do you put on the skin first? Yeah, I have not. So the question is the crisparol was not looked at concomitant with topical corticosteroid. 
it's supposed to replace your topical cartilage. So think about the Crisoborellus, the crawlimus. I don't know whether you put the crawlimus and topical corticosteroids right on top of each other. I, I, I tend not to because those are the two active medications. I would put the crawlimus, pimicrolimus, topical corticosteroids, or Crisoborell alone, uh, be, uh, and then the, uh, I could put either of the four plus emollient on top of it, but I wouldn't put these four together. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't I mean, I put the crawlimus with, yeah. I think it was like tacrolimus or something like that is putting that on areas like the, like the face, for example, where I'd use um, prime cilum, like, um, you know, on the body, let's say. Um, so yes, I, yeah. Whatever. But the, the crisoborol, um, since it's, uh, I, I, the impression is it's very helpful for itching. Um, yes. Is, is it put on the areas where they itch the most and use that instead of the steroid? or No, you, you, you sit. No, I I put it in areas that are prone to side effects of topical corticosteroids. I'll put it in the face, in the flexural areas. I I think of it, I put it in the same level as uh, acrolimus or pimicrolimus. So I put that, I would use it at the same level, although it has been shown to work also for uh, moderate atopic dermatitis. So its indication is mild to moderate uh, atopic dermatitis. And you can use it in children as well. So I see it in that level in terms of where I would give it to a child or to an adult. So do you and have then a, I do would... Have a, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, do you have a preference of, um, you know, um, Telsner inhibitor versus Crisparol that you would start first for those areas? Yes. The end, the reasoning is insurance. Okay. Uh, the crawlimus is already uh, generic. Okay. So they so can the, get it with minimum copay. Crisoborel is $100 or more to... Okay. So if, if they if they were to sell the calcineur inhibitor, then you would try the Crisoborel then? They yes. Can, they can yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, only because that's easier for the patient to get it. Um, yeah. My last question, yeah. since I'm full of questions today, um, um, <laughs> I was when I was started out as physician, um, you know, tar preparations were were like one of the main um, treatments. Mm. For, um, I don't think I've ever used tar preparations by, prescribed myself. I know the dermatologist when I started used to use them a lot, but um, I was I was surprised to see that again. Do you, do you use tar preparations very often, and which preparations no. do you use? <laughs> I okay. don't. First of all, it will stay in my bed sheet. <laughs> and we have so many. So the tar preparation was way back when, maybe I should take it off, the tar preparation way back then when we did not have the topical carcinoma inhibitors nor crisoborol because we only had a topical corticosteroids, and therefore you need an alternative. So they're hard to find. They uh, stain the skin. They stain the sheets, and they're very unpleasant looking and unpleasant smelling. So, no, I don't. I haven't used it, uh, but it's still out there. That's why I brought. I uh, included it in the in the is that slide. More for a barrier? Is that more for a barrier, or does or there or there's some immunological? No, function? it has anti. Yes, yes, it's an anti. It, it has some anti-inflammatory functions as well. Yeah. Does anybody know what the yeah. mechanism that is? Because it's also used for like seborrheic dermatitis, so it's an anti-inflammatory skin agent that TAR has been used. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm finished with my questions. Anybody else have any okay. questions? Okay. <laughs> Pilipimab is group to 12, correct? Dupilumab. I'm sorry, I didn't. Dupilumab. It's approved to 12. Dupilumab is 18 and above. Are you talking about the age indication? Yeah. yeah, 18 and above. 18 and above, current studies are going on for 12 to 18. Okay. Uh, yeah, because one of the, I, I think for me, it will become an issue when we start to see children, is that um, 
uh, it's a theoretical uh, consideration now for any newer uh, um, uh, biologics that the FDA wants them to put no live vaccines is one. And the other one at the FDA say is cytochrome P450. They are theoretical, and newer drugs that get FDA approval, biologics will ha will put in these two avoidance, avoid live vaccine. So in children, that would be your MMR, and so you want to make sure that the child has completed their MMR before you start your dupilumab, if you're going to look at that caution. In adults, it's, it's just more or less a shingles vaccine, yellow fever. Uh, there's really not much uh, live vaccines in adults. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a, those are interesting warnings, yeah. Thank you, Lois, for taking the time to speak with us this morning, and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.